Our first speaker this morning is the Reverend Dr. John Baer, the Dean of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary in Crestwood, New York. Father Baer is a professor of patristic, patristic, excuse me, at St. Vladimir's, as well as a dis distinguished lecturer of patristics at Fordham University. He has a BA in philosophy from Thames Polytechnic, a master of philosophy in Eastern Christian studies from Oxford University, and a doctor of philosophy and theology again from Oxford. While at Oxford, uh, Father Baer studied under the renowned Orthodox scholar and spokesman Bishop Callistos Ware, who, together with other academic luminaries such as Andrew Louth and Rowan Williams, now Archbishop of Canterbury, supervised him during his doctoral thesis. Father Baer is the author of more than 30 articles and six books, including Asceticism and Anthropology in Irenaeus and Clement, published by Ox Oxford University Press in 2000, and his multi-volume, The Formation of Christian Theology, including the Way to Nicaea and the Nicene Faith, which began appearing in 2001 and is still in progress. His most recent publication is The Mystery of Christ, Life in Death, published by St. Vladimir's Seminary Press in 2006. Father Bear also serves as the ed editor of St. Vladimir's popular patristic series and is on the editorial board of Pro Ecclesia and the patristic's I'm, I'm having trouble with patristics this morning. Patristics <laughs> monograph series uh, of the North American Patristics Society, published by Catholic University Press. I learned just recently, uh, this is on a less formal note, that Father Bear is uh, uh, a distinguished uh, cyclist as well as cheese lover, uh, and is, is sometimes uh, asked at conferences and elsewhere uh, recommendations regarding cheese that uh, he, he would offer. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you do that, but if you feel a need, you're, you're, I think he would probably welcome that. His paper today is entitled, The Promise of the Image. Please join me in welcoming Father John Baer. He gives the example of Peter in the Gospels. He points out that Erich um, Auerbach already, point, already noted, he says, here we can see the image of a man in the highest and deepest and most tragic sense compared with a portraiture of the great classical writers. So really a, an elevated image. Yet he is nothing but a Galilean peasant. And that is not only not in good taste, it's an act of rebellion. You're taking a Galilean peasant and you're depicting him in the most human way possible. And so Cart concludes from this, he says, we see here something beginning to emerge from darkness into full visibility. Arguably, for the first time in history, the human person as such invested with an intrinsic and inviolable dignity and possessed of infinite value. So the very fact that we habitually and unthinkingly speak of all human beings as persons is a testimony to the impact that Christianity had and the revolution that Christianity is that this had upon all human history. To have a person, strictly speaking, was a right which Roman law bestowed only upon particular citizens. Slaves were human beings, but, but non habens personum. They did not have a person. So the fact that we think of all human beings as, as having a person and their personhood being the key mark of their identity, of their um, uh, dignity, of their freedom, of their worth, that's a testimony to the revolution is Christianity. This is in his book, Atheist Illusions, which is really quite a, quite a read. For Christians in the ancient world, he continues, the gospel was literally a message of liberation in a manner we can barely begin to comprehend today. Christ had triumphed over the powers of this world. All the things to which human beings had subjected themselves, but which Christ had showed to be nothing. We were freed from all of that. The elemental spirits of the universe, things which have no power over us, but which we give subservience to. Things which are not, but which hold us in thrall. And you've got all the imagery in, in Colossians, especially about those kind of things. 
Today, we might want to say, well, perhaps it's the market forces that hold us in thrall. They are not. There's no such thing as market forces. Um, there's human egoism, but we project as market forces, and then we give subservience to them. Well, his triumph has tamed all of this. It's, it's overcome the world. It's tamed the fearful world in which human beings had formerly lived. That he created the world ex nihilo emphasized the absolute transcendence of God, and in reverse, a transcendent God could be experienced as imminent within creation. And creation itself was now understood as a gratuitous expression of divine love, a place of beauty, a place of wonder, whose diversity reflected the manifold wisdom of God, a subject, therefore, worthy of our investigation. Christianity actually inspired a scientific revolution rather than quashed it. The drama of salvation, the fact that it is enacted within this world and its history, going back to the beginning, looking forward to the eschaton, gives the whole time of creation a meaning and an orientation. Christianity is a revolution in the ancient world. And it's within this new world created by Christian Christianity, Hart argues, that our notion of the per person is born. And he says it's particularly born in the debates concerning Christology, the person and the nature of the incarnate Son of God. I mean, I'm going to quote a few longer passages, and the point will become clear through them. He says, The rather extraordinary inference to be drawn from this doctrine of Chalcedon is that personality is somehow transcendent of nature. A person is not merely a fragment of some larger cosmic or spiritual category, or more perfect or a more defective expression of some abstract set of attributes, in the light of which his or her value, significance, legitimacy, or proper place is to be judged. This man or that woman is not merely a specimen of the general set of the human. Rather, his or her human nature is only one manifestation and one part of what, she or what he or she is or might be. Personality is an irreducible mystery, somehow prior to and more spacious than everything that would limit or define it, capable of exceeding even its own nature in order to embrace another, ever more glorious nature. This immense dignity, this infinite capacity, inheres in every person, no matter what circumstances might for now seem to limit him or her to one destiny or another. No previous Western vision of the human being remotely resembles this one, and no other so fruitfully succeeded in embracing at once the entire range of finite human nature in all the intricacy of its inner and outer dimensions, while simultaneously affirming the transcendent possibility and the strange grandeur presented within each person. So his argument would be that the result of all the intense theological reflection in the controversies that beset the church from the 4th to the 8th centuries over matters upon which Gibbon famously said they just turned upon a yotta. This was, he says, the, re the revolution, the, fruit, uh, the, the, the struggle which produced, in his words, the coherent concept of the human person as such, endowed with infinite dignity in, in all its individual moments, full of powers and mysteries to be fathomed and esteemed an unimaginably exalted picture of the human person, made in the divine image, destined to partake of the divine nature. So something profound happened in those early centuries, and it resulted in a new and a radically different way of looking at the world and understanding ourselves within the world. Now, he's clear in his, in his book that this was not an immediate result they didn't know they were doing this. They didn't come to the end of it and say, this is what we've done. Nor, on the other hand, does he say that any supposedly Christian society had ever lived up to that. But, he says, it provides an inspiring vision. A vision which then takes hold in souls and leads them to a further height of nobility. <coughs> okay, just two further quotations from him. He says... It required an extraordinary moment of awakening in a few privileged souls, and then centuries of the relentless and total immersion of culture in the Christian story, to make even the best of us conscious of, 
or at least able to believe in, the moral claim of all other persons upon us, the splendor and the irreducible dignity of the divine humanity within them, that depth within each of them that potentially touches upon the eternal. In the light of Christianity's absolute law of charity, we came to see what formerly we could not, the autistic or the Down syndrome or otherwise disabled child, for instance, for whom the world can remain a perpetual perplexity, which can too often cause pain, but perhaps only vaguely and fleetingly charm or delight. The derelict or wretched or broken man or woman who has wasted his or her life away. The homeless, the utterly impoverished, the distressed, the mentally ill, the physically disabled. Exiles, refugees, fugitives, even criminals and reprobates. To reject, to turn away from, or to kill any or all of them would, in, would be, in a very real sense, the most purely practical of impulses. And he means that. And in the ancient world, it would indeed have been the case. To be able, however, to see in them not only something of worth, but indeed something potentially godlike, to be cherished and adored, is the rarest and the most ennoblingly unrealistic capacity ever bred within human souls. To look on the child whom our ancient ancestors would have seen as somehow unwholesome or as a worthless burden and would have abandoned to fate, to see in him or her instead a person worthy of all affection, resplendent with divine glory, ominous with the absolute demand upon our consciences, evoking our love and our reverence, is to be set free from the mere elemental existence and from those natural limitations that pre-Christian persons to, took to be the very definition of reality. So the very definition of reality has changed in and through all of this. It really is the most remarkable and inspiring vision. And especially striking is the way in which Hart examines or focuses on those cases which are weak and broken. And I'm going to return to that point as well. All instances where our merely human instinct would be to turn away, rather like the disciples at the Passion of Christ. Turn away from them, pre preferring instead our idea and our ideals of what constitutes human dignity and divine existence. We do not see our idea, an ideal of that in these. We would rather turn away. So it's a vision which really reverses the terms, if you like, by a divine exchange, a communicatio idiomatum, if you like, to see the divine strength in human weakness, eternal life in death, the very logos of God in flesh, all these oppositions which are exchanged in this. This is a vision which is always going to appear as folly and scandal to human thought. And therefore, it will necessarily be a fragile vision and one that is all too easily forgotten. And so Hart concludes with a really troubling question. He says, how long can our gentler ethical prejudices many of which seem to me to be melting away with fair rapidity, how long can they persist once the faith that gave them their rationale and meaning has withered away? Love endures all things, perhaps, as the apostle says, and is eternal. But as a cultural reality, even love requires a reason for its preeminence among the virtues. And the mere habit of solicitude for others will not necessarily survive long when that reason is no longer found. If, as I have argued, the human person, as we now understand it, is a positive invention of Christianity, might it not also be the case that a culture that has become truly post-Christian will also ultimately become post-human? Okay? And that's the way he makes that case, really strikingly. This may not necessarily be so, but there doesn't appear to be much reason for thinking otherwise. Having abandoned the notion of dignity, 
Even Pinku resorts to the notion of a respect for persons. But if that very notion of person depends upon a Christian revolution, well then, what undergirds it when that is lost? And Pinker doesn't even try to address that one. Hart's, David Hart, David Bentley Hart's typically sharp posing of the question really does give us pause for thought. And there are two stages that I want to go through for, um, in response to all of this. Firstly, is it really the case that the personal dimension of human existence as we understand it today is really the fruit of the Christian revolution? Is this the best way to think about human dignity? Is being human to be equated with being a person, as this has come to be understood today? There's a whole nexus of themes in that which have not even begun to be unpacked yet. It's unquestionable that the primary category in which we understand ourselves today is as persons. That's clear. It's also clear that how we understand this, endowed with infinite dignity in all its individual moments, full of powers and mysteries to be fathomed and esteemed, as Hart puts it, or some variation on that, it's clear that how we understand this differs from previous generations and thereby betrays the fact that the term person has its own history and evolution. Human self-understanding, the experience of being a human person, of thinking of oneself as a self, of being a person, has changed throughout times and ages, just as it changes within the lifespan of a single human being how a four-year-old thinks of themselves as a person compared to our adolescent compared to an adult. It changes. You could almost um, rehash Ernest Hackle's recapitulation theory, that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, yeah, that what happens to us as an individual human being recapitulates what's happened to us as a human race. Charles Taylor, in his book, The Sources of the Self, points out, he says, there is some truth in the idea that people are always selves, that they distinguish the outside from the inside, for instance. But, he continues, the really difficult thing is distinguishing the human universal from the historical constellation and not eliding from the second into the first, so that our particular way seems somehow inescapable for humans as such, as we're always tempted to do. So people were always people who just never thought about themselves in this way, as we tend to do today. So unlike a statement of anatomy, you know, we have a head attached to a body, for instance, our articulation of personhood is necessarily self-interpretative and self-referential. It's necessarily specific, it's bound to a particular age, of the person concerned or the period of human history in which they are living, and to a particular cultural experience. And because of this, Charles Taylor suggests, no satisfactory general formula can be found to characterize the ubiquitous nature of a self-interpreting animal. In a sense, it's going to be impossible by nature, by definition. The human being is a self-interpreting animal. It's going to be like Heraclitus's river. You can't step into it twice. But that is how we understand ourselves today in the 20th century, as persons. That's our primary category. And it seems that our tendency to project our current understanding of ourselves as persons um, impacts our theological discourse. We project it into a universal and atemporal reality and even onto God himself. So some theologians, such as Maltman and Plantinga, have argued that the term hypostasis, the term for person, as developed by the Greek fathers, provides a fundamental insight into the personal existence of God, thus grounding all reality in the person. They would say it's intimately connected with the divine perichoresis, the divine indwelling of the persons, the three persons that the one God is, existing in a perfect unity with itself, with one another, 
as one of the writers puts it, as a zestful, wondrous community of divine light, love, and joy, transparent to one another in their mutuality and verve, in which there's no isolation, no insulation, no secretiveness, no fear of being transparent to one another. The social model of the Trinity that we have. That's then held up as a model for human beings created in the image and likeness of God to strive to replicate on earth overcoming all our limited individualism to enter into the community of true personal existence. You're all familiar with, I would guess, with that kind of um, social model of the Trinity and how that is then replicated upon um, the understanding of the human being as the image of God, as a person in communion with other persons. The adequacy of such claims with regard to the Greek fathers, is this really what Basil or Gregory or whoever was really doing? That's been radically challenged, dramatically challenged over the last few decades, and really it's not. But also, more interestingly, the, the methodology of that approach, it takes the concept of perichoresis as understood to be that which makes the three one, fills it out with, with terms borrowed from our experience of relationship and relatedness, projects it onto God, and then reflects it back onto us as the ideal norm which we should be um, attaining, uh, striving to attain. It claims this then provides an exciting, underutilized resource of Christian theology that resolves our current problem of individualism and gives new life to an ancient, little understood concept of what Trinitarian theology is all about. There's something circular going on in all of that argument. Other theologians, on the other hand, most notably Karl Rahner, have been much more circumspect with the term person. He points out that in antiquity, the term person signifies directly the concrete subsistence, the existing being. That the rational nature of a particular being is only signified indirectly. But, he says, the anthropocentric turn of modern times requires that the spiritual subjective element of the concept of person be understood. We've had an anthropocentric term. We, we think of personhood not so much as kind of a concrete existing entity, but rather in that spiritual subjective term. And so he argues that we should be really hesitant about using the term person to translate the term hypostasis when speaking about the Trinity. We cannot change how people will understand the term person, so we need to use a periphrastic construction. He says we should translate um, hypostasis in terms of mode of subsistence. Well, we may not be able to change how people understand the term person, but we're also not going to change their patterns of speech either. <coughs> Which shows that Trinitarian theology still uses the term person. It hasn't started to use the term mode of subsistence. A further point which should be noted is that the Greek fathers of the 4th century, the area I've been working in for the last few years, they are very reticent to use the, num the language of number at all. In fact, the language of three hypostases only occurs once in any of the writings of the Cappadocians. Okay? And St. Basil the Great, in his work on the Holy Spirit, is really emphatic. We do not use numbers. He says, when the Lord delivered the formula of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he did not make arithmetic a part of the gift. I'm actually quoting him. He says that directly. He says, he says, he did not say in the first, the second, and the third, or in one, two, and three. But he gave us a knowledge of the faith that leads to salvation by means of holy names. So that the faith is what saves. Numbers have been devised as symbols indicative of quantity. Count if you must, but do not damage the faith by doing so. Either by silence honor the ineffable things, or piously count the holy things. There is one God the Father, one only begotten Son, and one Holy Spirit. We proclaim each of the hypostases singularly, monachos, individually, singularly, and if we must use numbers, we will not let an ignorant arithmetic lead us astray into polytheism. Arithmetic is not part of the gift. We don't count one, two, three. We count one, one, one. One God the Father, one only begotten Son, one Holy Spirit. We proclaim each singly, he says, because the point is that each of them are radically incommensurable with the other. 
in terms of their identifying marks, as, as father, as son, as spirit. There's nothing in commonality in terms of their hypostatic property. Commenting on this, Vladimir Lasky in the mid-20th century puts it in a really paradoxical way. He says, in speaking of three hypostases, we are already making an improper abstraction. If we wanted to generalize and make a concept of the divine hypostasis, we would have to say that the only common definition possible would be the impossibility of any common definition of the three hypostases. Okay. What he's saying is that it's not possible to specify what is common to each of the three as hypostasis, for anything which is common to each of the three belongs to the nature. Just straightforward. It's, it's, Usia is what they have in common. Hypostasis is what marks them out individually, as father, as son, as spirit. So there's no concept of personhood which is equivalent to each of the three, but one happens to be called father, one happens to be called son, one happens to be called spirit. So you cannot use numbers in this way. So there is no concept of divine hypostasis being developed here. Okay. And the Noski goes on to say, for my part, I must admit, until now, I have not found what might be called an elaborated doctrine of the human person in patristic theology, alongside its very precise teaching on the divine persons of hypostasis, with the qualification that he noted earlier. Yes, you can... You can they did, they did articulate what is meant by hypostasis, but not in such a way as to elaborate a concept of hypostasis, but rather what is particular to Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, now the point of all of that excursus is to come back to our question, is that if dignity, as Pinker puts it, is a squishy subjective notion, inadequate for serious moral reflection, then clearly the term person the term upon which even Pinker unthinkingly relies, is an even more flighty and evasive notion. A complex term with a history of continual evolution, changing throughout time and throughout our own lives, how we understand and experience ourselves to be a person, let alone whether you can elaborate a concept of personhood. So to claim that the notion of person has its roots in the transformation of thought, the understanding of God, of creation, of the world, of human beings, of everything, achieved by the Greek fathers as they struggled to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation. I would argue that to make that kind of claim is really to mistake form for content, and in a very real sense to miss the point altogether. The theological debates of the 4th to 7th century were not about defining a notion of the person in the abstract. They were about defining ever more clearly what is to be said about a particular person, the one Lord Jesus Christ, that he is fully divine and human in one, without confusion, change, separation, or division. The one Lord Jesus Christ, known in two natures, with property of each nature concurring in one hypostasis or prosopon. It is this one about whom we speak in this way, using the language of hypostasis and usia. It is this one, not the terms themselves, and how they form part of a trajectory which culminates in how we now think of ourselves as person. It's this one that's important not the terms. So if the terms dignity and person provide neither steady ground nor clear content for an, for an attempt to answer the question of the psalmist, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Because clearly God is mindful of him. So if the, if the question of dignity human dignity or personhood are not the places to go for answering that, then perhaps we should actually return much more simply to the question of the human being, being human. This is a more fundamental category than person. It doesn't depend upon subscribing to particular structures or notions of human personhood or divine personhood. As I mentioned earlier, even slaves in antiquity 
were human beings, even if Roman law didn't describe them the dignity of having a person. And likewise, we now accept that being human doesn't depend upon our ability to think about ourselves in particular ways, or even to exercise our supposedly God-given or humanistically given human rights or potential. Being human is the, the raw fabric here. But it doesn't make it any the less difficult. What does it mean to be human? Returning to the idea of being human brings us back squarely to the notion of the image of God in the way that personhood doesn't or dignity doesn't. Being human does, because the two are directly correlated by Scripture. After making the whole of the creation, all the creatures by his word alone, God announces his particular project. Let us make anthropos in our image and likeness. Let us make anthropos in our image and likeness. Now, how this correlation between being human and being in the image of God has been understood, I'm sorry, but that also has a history. Over the past century, from Karl Barth onwards, there's been an increasing tendency to explicate our existence in the image of God in terms of human beings as relational beings, imaging the trinity of divine persons, that is God, in various ways. That's been very common throughout the course of the 20th century. However, the Apostle Paul and the fathers um, in the first millennium, with a couple of exceptions I'll come back to, they were, again, much more specific and much more focused, as our previous round of reflection came to, upon the person of Christ. It is he, the Apostle says, who is the image. Colossians 1.15. You know, unambiguously clear. He is the image of God in whom the fullness of divinity has dwelt bodily. Well, if the fullness of divinity dwells bodily in him, that means there isn't kind of a surplus of divinity somewhere else that we can get to through some other means. Okay? The fullness of divinity dwells in him bodily. That is why he's the image of God. As Christ is the image of God, Adam, who's made in the image according to the image, or according to the likeness, or however you want to translate the Hebrew and the Greek, is made in Christ's image. Adam already points to Christ. Adam is a type of the one to come. Now, very strikingly, the first Christian theologians to reflect on this, such as Irenaeus of Lyon and Tertullian, located the image directly in the body, how can it be located anywhere else, Irenaeus asks. If Christ is a visible image of the invisible God, the image has to be visible, therefore it's in the body. So the perfect human being, according to Irenaeus, is the commingling and union of the soul receiving the spirit from the Father, joined to the flesh which was molded after the image of God. Very straightforwardly. As the image is in the flesh... Irenaeus differentiates between the image and the likeness. The image is what is given to us in our God-given form, molded in this particular way. The likeness is as we strive to um, acquire the likeness of God, which we lost in the beginning. So he introduces the differentiation. So he says, In times long past it was said that Anthropos was made in the image of God, but it was not shown to be so. It was said, you know, Genesis, Moses proclaims it, but we haven't yet seen Christ the image of God. We said that he's in the image of God, but it's not shown to be so. For the word was as yet invisible, after whose image Anthropos was created. And because of this, he easily lost the likeness. When, however, God the word became flesh, he confirmed both of these. For he both showed forth the image truly, himself becoming that which was his image, and established the likeness in a sure manner by co-assimilating Anthropos to the invisible father through the word become visible. Tertullian does something similar. He combines Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 to say it's a, the man molded from the earth that is in the image. So Tertullian writes, he says, whatever form the clay expressed, when it's being molded in this way, yeah, in mind was Christ, who was to become human, which the clay was, and the word flesh, which the earth then was. 
For the father had already said to his son, let us make man in our image and likeness, and God made man that is the same as fashioned, unto the image of God made he him. He means Christ. The word is also God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. Thus, that clay, already putting on the image of Christ, who was to be in the flesh, was not only the work, but the pledge of God. Okay, so the body molded from the earth and the mud from the earth is an image of the one who's to come and thereby the body itself becomes a pledge of the one who is to come, that he will indeed come in the flesh. Okay? Um, I'm going to come back to the eschatological dimension in a minute. Now, no doubt Irenaeus and Tertullian were um, writing what they're doing because of the threat of Gnosticism, the, the disparagement of the body and so on. Almost no writer after them would locate the image of God directly in the flesh in that way. Under the influence of the theologians from Alexandria, the latter tradition was much more likely to locate the image of God in human beings in their intellectual or noetic faculty. Okay? But again, this has to be understood in a Christocentric perspective. If we are in the image of God insofar as we are rational, logikos, is because we're in the image of the logos. Okay? So it's again related directly to Christ in that way. We were made in the image of God, St. Athanasia says, by being granted a share in the power of God's own word, so that having shadows of the word and being made logikos, we might be able to partake of the word and live the life of blessedness in paradise. When emphasizing that it's in our rational faculty, he doesn't mean to deprecate the body at all, but to emphasize that even if we live in the body, and there's no suggestion that it should be otherwise, we are not meant to live for the body. Okay, the body is our ground of existence in which we should be contemplating God the Word. However, we turn to what belonged to ourselves, to the body, and so the body in that way became the obstacle because we turned our attention to it rather than to God. With our attention turned to the body, well, how else was God going to get our attention apart from coming in the body? So he takes the body in order that we might know him. So we can come to know him through the body. Not as body, but through the body, through the works he does as a body. So we first of all know him as man. Who is this man that's born, that's hungry, that's thirsting? And then we ask, well, what manner of man is it that can do these things? And in following this, we then become to be part of his body in witnesses to his resurrection. That's the kind of picture you get with Alexandrine school. It's played out in numerous ways over the millennia that follow. But in the first millennium, with, apart from two exceptions, the predominance of the tradition is to relate the image of God to Christ in a Christocentric perspective. Okay? The two exceptions are kind of interesting. It's firstly the Antiochene theologians, such as Diodor of Tarsus and Theodor of Mopsuestia. What they do is, because they separate the Old Testament from the New Testament and refuse to read the Old Testament in any kind of Christocentric perspective, it doesn't speak about Christ at all. It speaks about its own hysteria. They are led to interpret the image of God outside a Christological perspective, and they will then say, well, it refers to our dignity within creation, our kingship, our lordship, our rule of dominion, or whatever it might be, which is actually what all modern Old Testament scholars do um, in various ways, but that's a different question. The other exception, of course, would be Augustine, who employs a range of psychological imagery relating the interrelated faculties of the human being to the image of the Trinity. Um, and that's a different question altogether. I don't want to focus in on that. Now, however we define what constitutes the existence of human beings as created in the image of God, we are still confronted with the anomaly that this truth is not self-evident. Just like the question of human rights or human dignity is not self-evident, it's a statement of faith. So also with the question of, of being in the image of God. St. Gregory of Nyssa, in his treatise on the making of man, asks this question point blank. He says, how then is man, this mortal, passable, short-lived being, the image of that nature which is immortal, pure and everlasting? The answer to this question, perhaps, um, only the truth knows it himself. But the word of God doesn't lie when it says that man was made in the image of God, nor is the pitiable suffering of man's nature like the blessedness of the impassable. 
Okay. It's not self-evident. We look at human beings around us and we see sickness, suffering, and death, decay, corruption. What kind of statement then is it that, however you unpack it, is it then that we talk about being made in the image of God? Gregory goes on to suggest, by, as he says, by conjectures and inferences, that the discrepancy should be understood in terms of the distinction between the statement of intent, let us make Anthropos in our image, and then the actual action of God, which is not to make Anthropos, but to make males and females. Interesting. And then Gregory links the males and females to the second creation narrative um, in a way which um, other writers also took up. So God's stated intention is to make Anthropos in his image. But what came to pass in this world is males and females. And Gregory says this is a provisional measure enabling us to grow into the fullness of our true estate in Christ. In other words, although we are males and females now, we're not yet human. Interesting. In these writers, then, the truth of human beings as in the image of God is not a protological statement, but rather an eschatological statement. It's not something which we had but lost, it's something which we are striving to achieve. The truth of human beings is not found in a lost golden age of primordial perfection, which is a myth which is common throughout all human existence in all cultures. They've all got some kind of return to the ideal state. But rather, it lies in the stature of humanity to which we are called, the stature which Christ alone has shown. Remember the body, which is a pledge of the fullness that is to come. So as Paul puts it, our life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we will appear in glory with him, being conformed to his body. And you get this perspective in the Greek fathers all the way through to the end of Byzantium and beyond. Nicholas Cabasilus, writing in the 14th century, says exactly the same. He asserts it's not Adam, but Christ, who is the first true human being in history. I'm quoting him. He says, It was for the new Anthropos that human nature was created at the beginning, and for him mind and desire were prepared. It was not the old Adam who was the model for the new, but the new Adam who's the model for the old. If Adam's described as being a type of the one to come, a type is what's kind of impressed in wax after you put the seal on it. It means a seal already exists. Yeah? Adam's a type of the one to come. He bears an image, a foreshadowing of that which is to come. So it's not the old Adam who is a model for the new, but the new Adam for the old. For those who have known him first... The old Adam is the archetype because of our fallen nature. As we're born in this world, we're born in Adam, we know Adam first. But for him who sees all things before they exist, the first Adam is an imitation of the second. To sum it up, the Savior first and alone showed to us the true Anthropos who is perfect on account of both character and life and all other respects. So Christ is the first true human being. This is taken seriously by the early church. I'm going to finish with three examples of how this is taken seriously. But we have to start with the point that if it's through the passion, his crucifixion and resurrection, understood not just simply by seeing it, but by the scriptures being opened and sharing in the breaking of the bread, that we finally come to know who he is, then it's likewise in and through our own taking up of the cross that we finally come to be, become in the image of God and become fully human. So when St. Irenaeus penned that line, which is quoted by everybody, that the glory of God is the living human being, the glory of God is the living human being, everybody knows that quotation, he does not mean what we might mean today. The glory of God is being a person in the fullness of all our rights and inner potential, all that it is to be alive, to be all that we can be. He is speaking specifically of the martyr. That is the living human being. The one who goes to death in confession of Christ. So he says, 
In this way, therefore, the martyr bears witness and despises death, not after the weakness of the flesh, it's not because the flesh is weak and they're going to die anyway they go to martyrdom, but by the readiness of the spirit. The spirit is strong, the flesh is weak. For when the weakness of the flesh is absorbed, it manifests the spirit as powerful. And again, when the spirit absorbs the weakness, it inherits the flesh for itself. And from both of these is made a living human being. Living because of the spirit, human because of the flesh. From both of these is made a living human being. The strength of God is made perfect in weakness, and so paradoxically, it's in their death, their ultimate vulnerability, that the martyrs bear the greatest witness to Christ. It's not that they think death is unimportant, that they just glib about it, but rather they are now vivified by the Spirit. They're no longer living the life of the flesh, they're living the life in the Spirit, and this is what a true human being is. Flesh vivified by the Spirit. Manifest in Christ, manifest in the martyrs. A second example of this is Blandina. Um, There's a violent, bloody persecution in Lyon, in, in Gaul, in the year 177 AD. And we have a letter um, written from the Christians in Gaul to the fellows back in Asia and Phrygia describing this. And the letter is pretty certainly written by, Ignat by Irenaeus himself. Okay. It describes in really gory details all the, the aspects of the martyrdom. It describes how some Christians were taken to the arena, but, I'm quoting, they appeared to be unprepared and untrained, as yet weak and unable to endure such conflict. About ten of these weak Christians backed down, decided not to go through with the martyrdom, and the letter describes them as being stillborn or miscarried. And they caused great sorrow for all the others. They weakened the resolve of those who were about to go to the martyr. They saw their friends backing down. They said, well, perhaps we shouldn't do so as well, and so on. However, these stillborn Christians were encouraged by the zeal of others, especially the slave girl Blandina. And she really is a heroine of the whole story. She's named. Her mistress is not named. More lines are devoted to her than anybody else in the story. And she's also... Um, the paradigm of that Pauline principle, strength made manifest in weakness. She's a slave girl. She's a slave. She's a girl, 12, 13, whatever it might be, and she's, she's female. The epitome of weakness in the ancient world. Okay? As weak as you could possibly get. This is the model then. She's described as being so weak in body that the others were fearful that she wouldn't be able to make her confession. And I'm quoting now. She says, she was filled with such power by God that even those who were taking turns to torture her in every way from dawn till dusk were weary and beaten. They themselves admitted that they were beaten, astonished at her endurance as her entire body was mangled and broken. Pages of this, okay? So she, in her weakness, is filled with divine power, and in this way she becomes identified with the one who died for her. So the description carries on. She seemed to hang there in the form of a cross. She's put in a stake to be eaten by the wild beasts. She's hanging there in the form of the cross. Okay. And by her fervent prayer, she aroused intense enthusiasm in those who were undergoing their ordeal. For in their torment, with physical eyes, they saw in the person of their sister him who was crucified for them. Okay. They, so she's actually embodying Christ now. They saw the one who was crucified for them. That he might convince all who believe in him that all who suffer for Christ's sake will have eternal fellowship in the living God. So she becomes a living image of Christ in her death. She no longer live, lives, Christ lives in her. Her passage out of this world coincides with Christ's passage back into this world. It describes her suffering it, and that of another Christian who suffers along with her called Atalus. And then the letter continues, and this is really paradoxical language, but it shows just how, how straightforward they were about this. So it says, through their continued life, that means through their death, okay, through their continued life, the dead were made alive. The dead who are being made alive are those who backed down from martyrdom and were still living. You know, they were still born, they were miscarried Christians. They kept alive according to the flesh. They were dead they are now being made alive by the death, by the life of the others. So, so through their continued life, the dead were made alive, and the martyrs showed favor to those who had failed to witness. And there was great joy for the virgin mother 
in receiving back alive those whom she had miscarried as dead. For through them, the majority of those who were denied were again brought to birth, again conceived, and again brought to life, and learned to confess. And now, living and strengthened, they went to the judgment seat. Okay? So the virgin mother, the church, is giving birth to children, to Christ's, as they identify themselves in Christ's passion and become living images at the moment of their death um, to Christ who's re-entering this world through them. This is their birth, and this is why we celebrate the, the death of the martyrs as their true birthday. So, really dramatic example there, very vivid, lively example. The, the, the final example I want to end with is equally dramatic, and it's St. Ignatius of Antioch. He's going from Antioch to Rome to be persecuted, to, to be torn apart by the beasts in the, in the amphitheater. And he claims that only in this way will he become human. He writes to the Christians at Rome, and he implores them not to interfere with his coming martyrdom. He writes them saying, whatever you do, don't try and get me out of the martyrdom. Don't try and intervene with the judges or the, or the officials and, and get me in this, a pass on this one. And he writes, he writes this way. He says, it is better for me to die in Christ Jesus than to be king over the ends of the earth. I seek him who died for our sake. I desire him who rose for us. The pains of birth are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren. Do not hinder me from living. Do not wish me to die. Do not wish me to die by keeping me alive. Yeah. Do not give to the world one who desires to belong to God, nor deceive him with material things. Suffer me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I shall become a human being. I shall become an anthropos. Suffer me to follow in the passion of my God. So undergoing death in witness to Christ, Christ who is the perfect human being, as St. Ignatius says, the new human being. Undergoing death in witness to Christ is a birth into life to emerge as Christ himself, a human being. Okay, we have yet to become human then. We're not yet human. We've yet to become human in the stature of Christ, who is the image of God revealed to us within this world. And now perhaps now we can hear a renewed depth in the final words of Christ from the cross in the Gospel of John, when he says, it is finished, to tell us that. We tend to hear it, you know, it's come to an end, I'm about to die, it's all finished, how are you going to take it? But it's, it's more than that, to tell us it's brought to perfection, it's completed. It's not, he's not simply declaring that his earthly life is now over, but rather that the work of God is fulfilled or completed. So the divine economy, the divine work of creation and salvation together, told from the perspective of the cross, culminates in this point. Teteliste, it's finished. And I would say specifically, the goal of God in Genesis, let us make anthropos in our image. Here we finally have it. As Pilate said a few verses earlier, behold the man. Eke homo, idu or anthropos. Behold the man. So the work of God is complete. The Lord of creation now rests from his works in the tomb on the blessed Sabbath by undergoing the passion as a human being. By undergoing the passion as a human being, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, himself God, fashions us into the image and likeness of God the image of God that he himself is, so that we can now finally become human as well. As St. Irenaeus puts it, the work of God is fashioning human beings. Okay. That's his intention in Genesis. That's completed at the Passion. We enter into that and we'll actually become humans, at least for the way that Ignatius, Irenaeus, and others understood it in the early church. We become in his stature by following him in that way. Okay, there are two conclusions I want to draw from this, and I know I've already gone over my time, but the two conclusions I want to draw from this. The first point I would make is that all of these claims are not part of an empirically verifiable discourse. They are not. They are statements of faith, and they are interpretative statements. That Blandina appeared in the likeness of Christ you can be absolutely sure 
was not noticed by those who were sitting in the amphitheater. Yeah? All they saw was another tragic case of a deluded figure being torn apart by beasts. They didn't see the image of God in her. Okay, so it's an interpretive statement. It's only those in the arena who were engaged in the trial with her that were able to see Christ in her. Not the others. And more to the point, they were able to see this specifically as an encouragement for each one of them to undergo the trials that were about to befall them. It's not a neutral statement. It's not an objective, verifiable statement. It's a specific, um, it's an exhortation more than anything else. That they will then endure the trials in order to be born again in the Virgin Mother to become a true human being. Or if you want to be really precise, it's in fact Irenaeus who sees this. The author of the letter, if indeed he's the author of the letter. It's he who sees this. It's he who sees things in this way, who inter- it's he who interprets the events that he witnessed in the light of Christ. It's he who sees Blandina as a figure of Christ and then describes her as a figure of Christ for our benefit. You can't get out of that interpretive dimension. It's not a neutral, empirically verifiable statement. It's, it's a very particular statement. You know, the second point I would make is that in the light of that point, the point I just made, we have to acknowledge the point that Greg of Nyssa made, that looking around us, we do not see directly images of God everywhere. Instead, we see men and women living broken lives, falling sick, and ultimately dying. However, rather than say that despite these empirical conditions, each one of them really is a person and therefore to be respected as such, I would say it would be better to say, it would be better to say that what we see, um, it would be, be better to allow our interpretation to be guided by the light of Christ. So that we can say that what we see are images of God being fashioned. Human beings in the making. In other words, if you say that you know, despite all these empirical conditions, nevertheless, all these broken cases that David Bentley Hart lists are human persons, despite, the, despite appearances to the other hand, what you've actually done is kind of separate the two. It's not strength and weakness. There would be strength despite weakness. Yeah? But rather, in fact, take the light of Christ and allow that to be the guiding principle to say, so that you can say that in all of this broken weakness and tragedy, we see images of God being formed. The epistle of Barnabas, again from the second century, put it very pithily. He said, human beings are earth that suffers. Human beings are earth that suffers. We are clay that's being moulded. And how are we being moulded? We're being moulded by all the t- toils and tr- tribulations in which we live. And one can then go even further, if you do it this way, that it's actually in the brokenness and weakness that we see the images being formed, rather than despite the brokenness and weakness, we can still say they are persons. We can then say that, in fact, it's primarily in those that would not previously have been recognised. The autistic child, the mentally ill, the physically challenged, the derelict, homeless and imprisoned. It's primarily in them that we see what it is to be human. And in so doing and responding to them, we become human ourselves. And this is a dignity of being human, but it's a dignity which will never stand upon itself, but will always sacrifice itself. It's not going to stand upon itself and say, this is my dignity and therefore nothing else. No, it's a dignity which is actually born out and manifest and lived and realized in this sacrifice. But again, this is a faith statement. And it's one that Hart, David Hart, rightly suggests has changed the world in which we live. It's inaugurated and inspired a new creation. But I would add, as we have yet to become human, it's not necessarily the case that a post-Christian world would become post-human. 
but it may well lose its aspiration to become human. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just had, I was wondering if you could <coughs> kind of uh, sp go a little bit further in explaining how uh, the image of God does the kind of ethical work we want it to do when, I mean, the example of Blandina kind of is disturbing to me at some level. You get these examples of we become human through this kind of suffering, through this kind of torture and that sort of thing. Yeah. How does it do the ethical work? Um, well, th that's a very particular historical, yeah. historical epoch. I mean, there's no question about right. that. Although, in many places in this world, it's happening again. Yeah? So, I wouldn't want to min min <coughs> relative that by just saying what well, happened back then, never again. Okay? Um, but, 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 on the other hand, how do we become Christian? Yeah, we, we, we see an image of God in Christ, and we respond to that. But our act of integration into that is through baptism, which is death. And our life thereafter is one of taking up the cross. Yeah? Now, in the, case of, in the case of the martyrs, it's really graphic and immediate. But the, the 2,000 years following of Christian tradition reflection bears out in innumerable other ways in which that is played out. Yes? Uh, and so, so um, we, we could spend a whole, you, you spend 2,000 years talking about that. Of, of, but, 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 it, but it's got the same dynamic going on in it. Yeah? It is dying to myself, dying to myself in Adam, dying to my sinful self, dying to my fallen self, all of these different ways of doing it as overcoming my egoism and living a life of self-sacrifice and service. It's the same reality as what's happening with the martyr, but maybe not as you know, immediate and bloody. But it's as much, a, well, in some sense, it is, it is as bloody, it is as much a struggle because we don't want to do it. Yeah? Um, but in, in, in innumerable ways, the Gospels are full of it, Christian reflection thereafter is full of it. But the, 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 the central dynamic is what's being played out in that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess I have a question that is pretty closely related and doesn't quite want to leave that yet. Uh, I'm struck by how the, um, the suffering of both the martyrs, Blandina and others who suffer, works to their good, but also to the good of those who observe them. But it seems to have everything to do with seeing the suffering rightly. Yeah, uh, Rather than Absolutely. seeing it as bodily mangling or... Yeah. Uh, yeah weakness or waste, yeah. but I wonder how that is, uh, if, if it has everything to do with seeing rightly, how do you get people to see rightly? Is it something that you teach, or something that by meditation on Christ, or by the self-denying methods that you noted? Is it, is it through I, that goal? Um, I would say it's absolutely a matter of seeing things rightly. It is simply an undeniable fact that this world is full of suffering, period. Yeah? And from the beginning it has been so, period. Um, you could, you could even take, take it a step further. You know, actually, taking a step backwards to begin with, the, the, the matter of seeing it rightly really depends upon starting with the passion of Christ as the moment of explication, yeah? the moment of understanding or the insight into understanding. If you don't start with that, you, you do not have the heuristic capable of understanding the world properly. Yeah? Um, and it's really made very clear in, in, in the gospel narratives. They don't understand until after the Passion. Yeah? Just, just forwardly. There's only one case in which one of the disciples understands him, and that's Peter on the road to Caesarea Philippi. But he immediately shows he doesn't understand him because he says, well, you're never going to go to Jerusalem to, get, to suffer. And Christ says, well, get behind me, Satan. You know, it's pretty strong language. Okay? So other, but other it's through the Passion. That becomes our, um, the prism, the lens through which we understand and then proclaim the Christian mystery. Okay? Um, specifying that more clearly by the fact that it's through the opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread. It's not just simply seeing him on the cross, nor is it seeing the empty tomb, nor is it even seeing the risen Jesus. They don't recognize him. It's opening the scripture and the breaking of the bread. And a whole lot more that can be said about that. Um, in the light of that, we are able to see and understand the world in different ways. Okay? It's... Um, it's really striking. If you, take this, if you take that seriously, God reveals himself not by things that we think of as divine, omnipotence, omniscience, throwing thunderbolts and whatever else it might be, or making everything right. He shows himself as divine uh, to be God, to be truly God, by the way he dies as a human being. 
by that which expresses all the weakness, all the futility, all the impotence, all the, the tribulation of simply being human, the thing which we think of as the most absurd part of our existence, that whatever we do, we're going to suffer, decompose, and die. Well, by that very means, he shows us what it is to be God. Yeah, really striking. Uh, this is that he conquers death by his death. It's not he dies because he's human, but because he's God, he can get himself out of the grave. That would be great for him, but it doesn't help anybody else. Yeah? It's by the way he dies as a human being that he conquers death as God. Okay? Um, now, this, if, if, you, if you take that seriously, it enables us to view our suffering, which is a, simply a given fact of our existence, and now turn that around and use it positively. Okay? So, we are all thrown into this world. Yeah? Nobody asked me whether I wanted to be born. There's no freedom in that. I'm thrown into this world in which whatever I do, I will die. Yeah? However good I am, I will die. However virtuous I try and make myself, I will die. Yeah? It's simply a brute fact. But now, through Christ's passion, I'm now able to transform the use of that death. And so my death, can, I can now use the brute fact of my death voluntarily as a birth to become human. Yeah? And that's what the martyrs are doing. And that's what we are doing in all our ascetic struggle in our ethical actions and so on. We're using our death creatively as a means of bringing life. So we see the suffering in others. We can't tell others, endure it, it's for your good. That's not the point. We see suffering in others. And the, the point that is that uh, we, we see suffering in others and the response is to sacrifice ourselves in service of the others. To die to my egoism and say, well, maybe I don't really need 10 pairs of shoes but rather give money or help out in whatever way it might be. But that's a way of using death. Yeah? Now, how to persuade others of that? Well, that's a big mystery of question of faith, isn't it? I mean, you can't talk other people into faith. All you can do is say, well, isn't actually this the best heuristic, most aesthetically beautiful vision that you can have? Doesn't it actually respond to, uh, doesn't it actually depict a God that's worth believing in? I don't know if one could do any more than that. Um, Oh, thank you. My name is uh, John Quietek, and I'm a chaplain at Beverly Hospital. And I'm with people who are dying on a daily basis. And uh, much of what you said to me has really touched me. I'll have a lot of thinking to do about it, a lot of praying to do about it. But it does add some meaning to what I see. It does add meaning to what, um, when I'm with a patient who's dying and who's struggling. And I've seen that. I've seen the person who's uh, offering up, they might say, their okay. suffering. Okay. Not just so that they won't go to, quote unquote, purgatory, but just so that it will be a purifying act mm -hmm. in imitation of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I see patients who are from many different, and some who have no religious background. So what you've said to me really touches me deeply. Uh, um, I'm gonna have to do a lot of thinking about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I really think that death is the big mystery. Just to the big mystery. Um, we, sacramentally, we die in baptism once for all. And if you read Paul, there's a very different change in tense. It's always, if we have died, we will live. Yeah, it's past and future. It's not, if you have died in baptism, you are now living with Christ in the resurrection. If you have died, you will live. We are caught between the sacramental act of dying in baptism and the reality of our death in the ground. Yeah? And in a sense, all our life thereafter is one of being able to train ourselves, prepare ourselves to be able to say, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And the question is going to be, well, where is your heart? If your heart's in, in your possessions in this world, your family, your, your image of yourself, your dignity, death is going to be painful. Yeah? But if you've learned to let go of all of that until death in the ground, um, then you'll be able to say, into thy hands I carry my spirit. The, the anomaly is that we are, we are caught between that and our actual death. We're caught in the first person singular. In the sense that I can only get to the end of the day and say, didn't I die well to myself today? Or, you know, and there's no other way of saying it. Yeah? When I'm dead in the ground, I can't say that. 
then I will finally be the clay in God's hands, and he will be the actor, not me. I'm learning to die. When I'm dead, he will actually become the actor, form the clay, Genesis 2. Yeah? So it really becomes into thy hands, I can my spirit, we have to train ourselves for that. And then not the two main sacraments of the Christian church, baptism and Eucharist, both devolve from death. Sa- de- uh, sac- uh, baptism, clearly, um, with uh, Eucharist. You know, do this in, as often as you do this, remember me, you proclaim my death until I come. Um, Irenaeus, uh, Ignatius describes himself as being uh, wheat ground together by the mouth of the lion in order to become the pure bread of Christ, clearly Eucharistic imagery. And Irenaeus takes it even further to say that just as uh, the grape and the wheat are placed in the ground, then by the grace of God they grow and bear fruit, we turn them into bread and wine, they receive the invocation, the word, and they become Eucharist. So also we are nourished by the Eucharist so that when we are placed in the ground, we will be raised by the, by the Spirit and have incorruptibility bestowed upon us by the Father. Yeah? So you, both baptism and Eucharist devolve or play themselves out from the mystery of death, which is the identi- identifying moment of Christ. There's so much in that. And you see it clearly day on a day-to-day basis. Great. Uh, John Paul Lotz. Uh, thank you, John, for your um, beautiful image of restoring the Imago Dei that you gave us. Um, and perhaps also from your orthodox perspective, subconsciously even showing us how theosis... Uh, yeah, I haven't used the word once, yeah. but, <laughs> but that's what we're talking about. Exactly. Um, slanting over, and I'm almost apologizing for perhaps a little bit more modernist perspective on this or from a more, more reformed perspective that, that I come from. What, help me understand the mechanism of recovering the image of God. I know that's very ugly language. Um, that distinguishes redemptive suffering from the crushing suffering that just eliminates millions of people on a daily basis. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I hear you right, but I don't think you're saying that suffering in general produces the image of God. And perhaps I could ask you to answer that with regard to the role of the Holy Spirit in terms of maybe, maybe not sanctification, but it is after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost that the scriptures come alive and they begin to understand Christ's sufferings and his life and it's after his glorification, John says, that these things become revealed to them. So maybe could you comment on the role of suffering uh, yeah. as, as suffering or the role of suffering as enlightened by the Spirit? It's a question of levels of interpretation, and you can't elide from one into the other, I think. Okay? So to go back to the point, you can't see the crushing suffering that is around there and go and tell them it's for your good. It doesn't make sense. It would be offensive. It would be patronizing. Um, and then the, the, the thrust of the Christian message with regard to the Imago Dei, which is being formed in and through all of this, is that um, we are to be the ones serving in this. It's not that you see somebody hungry and you say, put up with your hunger, you're being fashioned by it. No. The point is that we are the ones who then have to suffer in order to alleviate the suffering. Yes? Um, but that's operating on, on, on that kind of interpretive faith level statement. If you subscribe to it, if you don't, um, you have to produce a very different kind of language. If you, uh, we might be able to see in the suffering of the world around us images of God being fashioned, but you can't translate that into a neutral statement an objective statement for others. Does that make sense? It's, 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 it's almost like saying, in the light of Christ, all will appear as light. And our job is to make, make that light shed uh, throughout to all others by our own um, uh, voluntary conformity to the crucified Christ. I guess that's from uh, my concern with this. Suffering in general is Um, but what I was going to say is, this is how it all works within the faith language. Okay? And uh, how to speak outside of that is a very different question. Okay? But, but you can't just elide from one to the other and pretend there's no different kind of hermeneutic going on between them. Okay? You, in, in, almost in a sense, you just have to say with Paul, um, as, to, as to those who are outside, well, that's in God's hands. But the task I know is to bring relief to their suffering by my own acceptance of suffering. 
I don't know really if one can ever go beyond that kind of statement. Yeah? Okay, now every hand is raised. <laughs> I'll let you decide, Ryan. I think this gentleman right in front of you. Thank you very much. I want to echo the earlier comments on uh, you know, how, how delightful it was to hear such a beautiful account of, of suffering, and, and uh, I think there's a lot to appreciate there. I'm concerned about your account of creation, however. Uh, My account wanna, of your account of creation. I, wanna, I want to uh, uh, strain the ecumenical spirit uh, uh, just a little bit. Um, how are we to understand? You said it, it, it has always been this way. It, is, it has ever been so that there is suffering in the world, um, and I'm concerned about what this says. Uh, about the, uh, the, the, what we would think of as the prelapsarian condition of man, that, uh, um, that uh, effectively you seem to be stipulating that it is necessary that, that there be sin in the world. Can I, okay. no, and that, 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 that's, okay. that's all I just uh, how, how to deal with the question of prelapsarian? Um, have you ever read James Barr's book, The Garden of Eden, Hope of Immortality? He points out a really, really striking fact, which is... I think, undisputable, um, <clears throat> that it's only in the light of Christ that we can speak about that. Yeah? It's only in the light of Christ that we can speak about the fall. Think about it. Paul knew the scriptures as well as any of us ever do. You know, we, we try and imagine what a first century Jew might read the scriptures as. Well, he was. Yeah? Okay, he knew all of that. And he was persecuting the church. He did not think of himself as needing salvation. I was righteous with respect to the law, he says. I didn't need this. Yeah. Um, it's a really striking fact that uh, Adam and Eve are not mentioned thereafter after Genesis. They're not mentioned. It's, uh, there are many striking facts here. Um, there is, apart from Psalm 50, there's almost no depiction of the world as lying, just within terms of the Old Testament itself, of the world lying within sin in an unredeemable fashion of some kind. Probably the only place where that is described is, is before the flood. And then the flood washes it away and you start a new creation. It's possible to be righteous in the Old Testament. The Psalms are full of, you know, I'm righteous, save me from the ungodly. Job was a righteous man living before God. I mean, you've got all of that here. Yeah? It's much more nuanced than we tend to think. Um, you've also got the fact that death in and of itself is not a problem in the Old Testament. God kills and he makes alive. All is in the hands of God. You reach the ripe old age, of course you die, you go to the land of the patriarchs. I mean, really, it's, it's thought of in much more holistic terms like that. Paul, reading all of that, was not expecting um, a saviour. He wasn't. I was persecuting the church because they were teaching such stupidity. Yeah? Um, it's in the light of Christ. He says, well, if Christ is a saviour of all, therefore it means all men need salvation. And it's in the light of Christ who will say... Um, as sin came into the world through one man, death uh, and death, uh, death through sin. So life was brought into the world through one man. It's in the light of Christ that you get the Adam-Pauline contrast. That is vitally important to recognize the hermeneutic by which such a statement is made. Because what it means, as um, E.P. Sanders points out, is that the solution comes first, and then we identify the problem. Yeah? So no Jew today reads the Genesis account in the way that a Christian would. It's an interpretive statement made in the light of the passion, opening up the scriptures in this way. Well, that means it starts at a cross, doesn't it? Okay. A couple more questions. Okay. Many Christians uh, have used the idea of our being created in the image of God, uh, our personhood, certainly our common status as human beings uh, to uh, argue against certain practices such as abortion uh, or uh, euthanasia. Um, I'm curious how you would take up any stance against those or how you would argue if you're against dropping, the practices or against those who? If, if we can't say right. that uh, the, the, what is formed in the womb is a human being or a person um, what are we left with then? No, what we can do, and this is the point of making, is that we, we as Christians can identify everybody as images of God. We can see in everybody the image of God, but that's an interpretive statement. Yeah? And in the light of that, we can absolutely maintain the sanctity of life and so on. And there's the Christians who did. It was them who you know, stopped abortion, rescued the, those who are 
um, abandoned, the, the infanticide, all, all of that, taking up the kids who were left in the gutter and taking them into Christian homes in order to, to bring them up in the church. From the, from the beginning, churches ha Christians have done that and will continue to do so. But we cannot but recognize that the grounds upon which we are doing so is um, a faith-based conviction. Yeah? And even, it's just straightforward, it, um, there's no other way of doing it. So even, even Pinker, when he talks about, you know, okay, the dignity is a, a squishy notion, let's, let's move to autonomy of person and the respect for person. Well, that's just as much a faith-based notion. It is. <laughs> Thank you. I particularly appreciated uh, your putting forth the particular as over against the abstraction of human personhood and so forth. I had a, a question about how then, if it's if the the correct hermeneutic is dependent upon a faith perspective, how do you speak across the gulf? to Pinker, to anyone else, hmm. uh, in, in not just in a court of law, but just in finding common ground? Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. a big question. <laughs> that really is a big question. Um, it would, I, I think it would ultimately depend on what enterprise you are engaged in, in that. But you have to be very clear about what it is you're saying and how it is you're saying it. So, uh, what's his name? At um, the, the Jewish scholar at Hebrew Divinity School. Um, in other words, wait, 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 I think when when talking across faith uh, traditions. You can't just assume that you're talking the same language. Take it another step and actually talk about how you're talking about what you're talking about. Articulate your first principles and your hermeneutics rather than just assume that you're talking about the same thing. So let's give you a really trite example. Whenever I meet a young person who tells me they don't believe in God, I say, well, what God is it you don't believe in? Okay? You may not well, it may well not be the same person I'm talking about. I may well agree with you on that. Yeah? Don't assume that the word God has a static meaning in my discourse and in your discourse. Yeah? What, what, so so, so, so yeah. you have to be able to achieve a common language and common dialogue, but you don't do so in any other way than being really careful about how it is you're speaking and what meaning you're subscribing in this way. Right, but you also have the phenomenon for over 150 years now of very thoughtful individuals, you know, starting maybe, well, not starting with Nietzsche, but certainly dramatically displayed in someone like Nietzsche, who apparently... Uh, reject the entire hermeneutic that you've just put forward, saying, you know, that the whole concept that suffering in Christ is redemptive mm -hmm. uh, and actually produce, you know, productive of human personhood. Mm -hmm. uh, he's saying we should, that that's a, that goes against everything that we ought to be struggling for, this good and, and perfect in the human race. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's not a matter of being careful. It's a ma I mean, we really do have a gulf there. Um, it is a matter of being careful. Well, I'm it, you, not, you not denying, denying that. I'm just saying but, but, but in but that it, case. But it, but it is also a matter of being honest. You know, Nietzsche and others, well, they still died, didn't they? You know, I'd like to have had the conversation with him on his deathbed. He might have changed his mind, which is why the deathbed conversations are always, you know, uh, move on beyond that. Um, and it's also a matter of being... Uh, realistic about what suffering there is in this world. It is really striking in modern 20th, 21st century America, death is put away. You just don't see it. You just don't see suffering in this country. No wonder then you end up with a discourse which says, well, maybe we can do without it. Yeah? Who are we kidding? <laughs> Um, I'm Ian Corbin. I'm a Gordon alum. I'm currently um, a doctoral candidate in philosophy at Boston College. I'm wondering if you could connect some some dots for us. So this is a, this is a like everyone said a, a lovely th more theoretical account you've given us. Um, what about a situation where um, you or I had the opportunity to stop a great deal of suffering? So let's say that the government took up a policy that 
uh, Muslims or Christians or the disabled were to be maimed, tortured, killed. And you or I could write a, you know, a, a really brilliant article that would change everyone's mind. I, I'm sure you have room for that in your account, but could you sort of explain to us how this, oh. this, this account you have that really emphasizes the redemptive power of suffering I connects think, directly with my duty to write the article that would stop all the suffering. No, I think absolutely we should be involved in trying to alleviate, stop suffering in any way, shape, or form. Um, where most of us are uncomfortable at that is that it might involve us then in suffering. Sure. You know, we, we say, well, we, 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 you're not allowed to do that, and we try and find a neutral discourse in which you will have, in which we can justify it, personhood, dignity, whatever else it might be. Um, we need to uh, stand up and say no to this, but then not be afraid to die as a result. Sure. And there's a, there's a redemptive suffering. But, but, but what if suffering isn't re required? What if I don't have to suffer to do this? Where, where does my duty to stop that suffering fit in with this, your, your whole story of the, the incredibly redemptive, important... But th that's so particular that I can't answer that. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be facetious or glib or try and divert it, but that really is very particular to you in your particular situation and whatever situation you, you find yourself in. And it's your conscious call on that. I, mean, I don't know what more I can say than that. Okay. You know, we're all going to find ourselves in innumerable different situations in which we're going to have to try and assess what it is we should do in the light of our faith. What we should not do is to protest something and then complain about suffering ourselves as a result which is what we try and do when we make it into a neutral discourse. These people should not suffer because they're persons, it's dignity, it's, it's, it's a neutral discourse in which there's no faith-based involvement, I don't need to suffer, I can make that case. 